Professor Bellantone, Professor Lombardi, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this uh, very, very important Congress and uh, also and all the, the scientific, uh, scientific committee. You know uh, that uh, today uh, is not so, not only uh, a problem about the patient, the guidelines about the patient, about the surgical uh, procedure, but it's a very, impo a very important problem also about the legal problem for, for uh, especially for the surgeon that uh, they have to follow all the guidelines. Just for this reason, it's a, a very important uh, now and uh, welcome also uh, all, the, all the faculty and welcome in Rome. I will not abuse of your time. We start immediately with the first talk, which is the international guidelines, but Matthias Ringel. Please, Matthias. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Now? Yes? Now we got it. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be uh, speaking here and also uh, to be the first speaker um, for the, to, to kick off for the meeting. We'll see if this Pointer works. Here. Yeah, I know. Well, Randolph just took all my time, so it's okay. Um, all right. This is there. Now that, that, that worked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, it's an honor to, uh, to be here to speak about uh, the guidelines. Uh, my name is Matt Ringel. I'm from Ohio State University. Um, I do uh, both clinical as well as uh, basic research in thyroid cancer. Uh, it's a little daunting to give this talk to this crowd because I think the people who wrote most of the things I'll talk about are sitting in the room, so uh, hopefully I'll get it straight. Um, and what I'm going to do is focus on uh, a patient and do a walkthrough of how we approach them using the American Thyroid Association guidelines, but also talk about and have a few slides of similarities and differences with guidelines. Now, I understand that uh, you'll have many talks throughout here that'll talk, focus on nodules and are going to focus on surgery, so I'm going to do a more general overview and, and leave some of the details to them. I am, uh, as a, in terms of guidelines, I am a member of the NCCN guidelines panel, the National Cancer Center Cooperative Network uh, in the United States, and I'm the current co-chair of the uh, of the working group now for the Th American Thyroid Cancer Association Thyroid Cancer Guidelines. There are two separate guidelines that will be done this time, a separate one for thyroid cancer and a separate one for thyroid nodules to go along with a separate one for medullary cancer, pediatric thyroid cancer, and anaplastic thyroid cancer. So to make everyone crazy, we'll have lots of guidelines. So. So in uh, 2015 to 2018, the mode for most guidelines, not just the ATA guidelines, have been to focus on individualization of thyroid cancer therapy, uh, to have ri risk and staging stratifications that are expanded to include things that we do clinically all the time but hadn't codified, really. Uh, things like how do we evaluate the initial patient, how do we decide after surgery what's their status, and then how do we decide what their status is after initial therapy so we know where to go forward after that. Uh, I'm not going to focus on this because I think you'll have a lot of talks on this. If I start taking too many slides, Susan Mandel will throw something at me But uh, there and, and others in the room. Uh, but uh, there's been a move in all the guidelines, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the TIRADs here, uh, about the focus of pattern recognition for diagnosing thyroid cancer. Uh, and the latest version, of course, of the staging to predict mortality from thyroid cancer, which is AJCC, UICC staging, or TNM system, um, and then the stratification systems that were put into place in the last set of guidelines from the ATA in 2015 and that are now going to be modified based on further, uh, further data. Let's see if this will go. And then, of course, the response to therapy that I mentioned. So again, 2019, we have our new Thyroid Cancer, Not Nodules Guidelines Committee for the American Thyroid Association. Julianne Sosa, who will be doing a um, uh, conference uh, call uh, and the last day uh, for everyone uh, to be part of is the co-chair. She's at UCSF and is a surgeon. 
We have 15 members, 17 total if you include the chairs. Uh, some of us are multiple specialty, and you can see the breakdown, including endocrinologists, surgeons, equally matched amongst the specialties, I might add, uh, nuclear medicine, medical oncology, pathology, genetics counseling, which is new, and a patient advocate on the committee, which is new. We think this is a very important uh, change that we have. We have nine men and eight women on the committee. So we're formed, we've started working, we've got a systematic literature review going for key areas. Uh, we're beginning with a probable diagnosis of cancer for initial management decisions, and we're ending at the diagnosis of all kinds of thyroid cancer up to anaplastic thyroid cancer. So let's go back now to the most recent guidelines and walk through a patient and see a way that, that, that one might apply them um, uh, to this patient. So this is a patient, a 23-year-old woman, who noted a neck mass in May of 2008. Her physician thought it was likely a lymph node. She had no other symptoms. The TSH was normal, and no, nothing else was abnormal on her physical exam. It did not resolve. She ended up getting a CT scan four months later, um, and it showed right lobe thyroid nodules, perhaps a node in the neck, but it was felt to be normal in size, uh, and it was felt that the palpable lesion was probably the thyroid nodule. So she had a, an ultrasound of the thyroid uh, that revealed um, a couple of right lobe nodules, one two and a half centimeters, one 1.4 by 1.8 centimeters. They did not mention lymph nodes at all, and then she was referred for evaluation. So what would we have said in 2015? We would have said, well, the patient needs the TSH, TSH is done, TSH is normal. If you're in the United States, we would not generally recommend a calcitonin level, but if you're in Europe, the ETA, the ESMO guidelines in 2012, all the early guidelines would recommend a calcitonin level. So this is a difference between the guidelines for sure. Is the ultrasound adequate? Well, all of our guidelines, including the most recent ones from the ETA using UTIRADS, um, do recommend that lymph nodes be evaluated for an adequate neck ultrasound evaluation of a nodule. And that was not done in this case. And would you do a fine needle aspiration? The answer for all the guidelines, which I'll walk through in a moment, is probably yes. Um, based on the report, though, it wouldn't necessarily be the largest one that's kind of borderline in size. It would be the second largest one that had some of the features that we'll mention in a moment. So this is just a very brief summary. There's going to be a lot of talks on this. This is just looking at the guidelines going across. This is from an article, if you're interested, that we published in 2016 comparing guidelines. Um, uh, this is, uh, and you're going to hear more about this. This is just some of the, 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 the nodule risk uh, information that's included in the ATA 2016, the British Thyroid Association 2014, the NCCN in 2018, the AACAME in 2016, and the ETA 2017 with the UTIRADS, generally demonstrating with some differences uh, that all of these features, microcalcifications, the shape of the nodule, the borders of the nodule, extrathyroidal extension, hypoecogenicity, disruptions in rim calcifications, and the presence or absence of a halo are all included somewhere as risk features. In some cases, they're primary. In some cases, they're add-ons. Those are the asterisks. Of note, the mention that there are differences with the vascularity in these guidelines. Some include vascularity, British Thyroid Association and the ACE AME, uh, whereas others don't, and some, like the NCCN, it's not even discussed. So that's a, a difference that we have there, and I'm sure there'll be many talks coming up outlining these differences, as uh, the committee, I think, is going to give a talk at this meeting that's trying to put some of these together in a cogent way between the ATA and the TIRAD systems. So if you did an FNA, then you would have cytology to deal with. And there's no disagreement amongst the guidelines between benign cytology or malignant cytology, right? And the benign cytology, you follow. The malignant cytology, you're likely either to go to surgery or if the nodule's small and the patient prefers to active surveillance for a very low-risk papillary cancer. 
However, there are, there are differences in terms of how to handle indeterminate cytologies. Uh, the ATA uh, would say that if it's suspicious, you handle it just like it's malignant, um, and however you treat it is how you would treat it, and most of the panels agree with that going across, as you can see across the top uh, here. Um, if you then look at the uh, follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm or FLUS, um, then you uh, generally are, whoops, that, I don't know how to go back here. There we go. Um, uh, generally are um, either doing a more diagnostic testing, uh, either surgical or molecular diagnostic testing, uh, depending on, on the patient, or you could do observation, and then the atypias are generally handled the same as these uh, f uh, follicular lesions. So, so there are di di differences, but I think more similar than different to my reading of the guidelines through 2018. So let's go back to our case. So we do a neck ultrasound, and it confirms the presence of two nodules, but also abnormal neck lymph nodes that were not disclosed or looked at on the initial ultrasound. She's got abnormal nodes at level 3 and 2A with malignant characteristics. I'll come to that in a moment. The largest is posterior to the jugular vein. She's got a right posterior triangle node as well. Left lobe is normal. No concerning nodes were noted on the left side or in the central neck or in the lateral neck. And her TSH was repeated because I'm an endocrinologist. It's what I do, uh, and the TSH was completely normal. Review the CT scan images, again, not uh, reported on the CT report were abnormal lymph nodes on the right neck. So for those uh, who don't ordinarily look at all the scans, uh, always important to look at the scans when a patient comes in. So what about lymph node FNA? And the, um, the ATA kind of swiped this from the ETA guidelines from 2012, uh, looking at some characteristics on ultrasound to help you identify malignant nodes. And again, there's going to be much more of this at the meeting. So I'm not going to go into this in, in a lot of detail uh, because there's, we have, are having an advanced ultrasound course here as well. But suffice it to say that there are ways for those who do ultrasound uh, to tell a malignant node from a benign node with some degree of confidence as well. So what did we do? Well, instead of doing an FNA of the thyroid nodule or, or the one of the two thyroid nodules, we FNA'd the lymph node. And the lymph node uh, had thyroid cancer based on cytology, um, had a markedly elevated thyroglobulin in the FNA of 11,000 with a serum thyroglobulin done at that same time of 75, so clearly thyroid cancer. Um, and like I said, we didn't bother aspirating the nodule because it takes some of the vagaries out of the diagnosis as well. If there's thyroid cancer in a lymph node, there's thyroid cancer. So what were the next steps for in terms of the guidelines? How would you next approach this patient? Well, surgery is recommended. I'm not going to go into detail because that's the next lecture. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder on that. Uh, but in general, for intrathyroidal nodules without nodes, hemithyroidectomy or total are, gen are acceptable options, and I'm sure we'll hear about those decisions that would be made. And for more extensive disease, like in this situation, total thyroidectomy, compartmental node dissection uh, is, in, is recommended in selected cases. So what did what would happen with this patient? She had a total thyroidectomy, a bilateral central neck dissection, and a lateral neck si dissection on the right side where the lymph nodes were involved. No lateral neck dissection on the left side that had normal imaging. Her pathology had a 2.1 by 1.7 centimeter papillary cancer with local invasion. Local invasion was not clearly identified on the ultrasound. Um, in, it was invasive into muscle. Uh, there were five sites of vascular invasion, so past the magic number of four. That's in the guidelines for pathology for risk. Three of 14 nodes were positive in the central neck. They were all small, less than five millimeters. Four of 14 nodes in the right jugular chain uh, were positive with the largest 1.2 centimeters with extranodal invasion. And two of 46 nodes in the full lateral neck dissection were positive, including one that was 2.4 centimeters. So fairly extensive uh, disease. Radiology, in addition, she had a CT scan of the chest looking for distant METs because of the extent of nodal disease, not done on every patient in my practice, uh, but uh, there was no evidence of lung metastases on that, on that chest CT. Uh, sorry, this is being sticky with me there. 
So how would she be stratified by the ATA initial risk stratification from the 2015 guidelines? Well, she, uh, so patients that uh, would have a low risk for recurrence would be those that have small tumors, intrathyroidal, one to four centimeters, so uh, no local or vascular invasion, and they're now allowed to have small lymph node micrometastases or minimally invasive follicular cancer. And those patients have about a 15% likelihood of uh, having residual disease after, after surgery. Um, intermediate risk are basically everything that's not in lower high, as I like to say, and I'll go over the high in a moment. Uh, but these are higher risk variants of differentiated thyroid cancer, intrathyroidal between one and four centimeters, multifocal micro PTC with local invasion, and if you happen to do a molecular test and it's BRAF V600E positive, uh, then this would be considered an immediate risk. There's going to be movement on these topics in the new guidelines for sure, because there's been a lot of data in this area. And these folks that have this intermediate have about a 30 to 40% likelihood of having residual disease. And then if you're high risk, again, sorry, this is, uh, then are those of folks with gross extrathyroidal extension at surgery, uh, incomplete surgical resection, larger nodes, extensive vascular invasion if they're follicular thyroid cancer or distant METs. And those patients have about an 80% likelihood. Obviously, if they have distant metastases, it's 100% likelihood of them having residual disease after their initial surgery. Okay, what about this patient? Well, the TNM is either stage one or two because you don't yet know whether she has distant metastases. T4A, N1B, MX, based on the CT scan M0. Still within an excellent anticipated long-term survival based on the staging, but she would be at a high risk for residual disease or recurrent disease uh, based on the ATA stratification. Um, and in this case, we didn't do molecular testing because we didn't think it would impact any kind of therapeutic change that we were going to do, and we didn't need it for diagnosis in her case, and we didn't think it would have impact on any therapeutic decisions at this point in time, and I would still hold to that uh, based on where we are with the data. So what do the, uh, so the next step is always radioactive iodine, and so um, this is what's in the current guidelines from the